her communities and committed unspeakable atrocities. It was the deadliest day in Jewish history since the Holocaust. We cannot stand by and tolerate this. The people of Israel are fighting to protect their loved ones and their ancient homelands. We must stand by Israel's side. Join me in our nation's capital for the Christians United for Israel annual summit on July 28th through the 30th as Christians from across the country stand up and speak out on Capitol Hill in support of Israel. Together we can show the Jewish people that they are not alone. Welcome to Cornerstone Church. My name is Peggy Moyer, and I serve as the Director of Early Childhood Education. And I'm here to tell you about The Ark, a wonderful and unique home to our early childhood ministry. At The Ark, we seek to instill Christian values and beliefs and encourage children to explore, create, and play as they develop a love for Jesus Christ and learn the truth of God's Word. If you haven't joined us in the ARC on Sunday morning, we invite you to come check it out. If you're watching online with us, we are so glad that you have joined us today. I encourage you to let us know where you are watching from in the comments. And if you have a prayer request, we have a team ready to pray for you. I am excited for what God is doing through Cornerstone Church and am glad that you are here with us. Service is about to begin.
Good morning, church. Would you stand to your feet and join with us as we worship this morning? To those of you who are watching, welcome to Cornerstone here in San Antonio, Texas. This is Cowboy Sunday. Put your hands together and let's all sing. Some glad morning, I'll fly away. Some glad morning when this life is over, I'll fly away. Gracious Heavenly Father, we've gathered in the house of the Lord today to magnify, to glorify, and exalt the precious name of Jesus, who is Christ and Lord. Today, let burdens be lifted. Today, let bodies be healed. Let hearts and dreams be restored. Let the anointing of the Holy Spirit fill this house and let it go into the homes that are watching across America and around the world. Let this world that is stumbling in darkness hear the light of the gospel today and be liberated from sin and iniquity, that Jesus Christ might be exalted in all things. These things we ask in his majestic name and all of God's children said amen. amen. Give the Lord praise in the house. We welcome those of you who are watching across the nation to Cornerstone Church here in San Antonio, Texas. This is Cowboy Sunday in San Antonio. For the first time in 66 years, I'm going to preach without a tie. I pray that my mother don't strike me with the lightning from heaven before church is over. Those of you who are watching across the nation, today I'm completing the prophetic series, Abraham to Armageddon. This is a comprehensive statement of what's going to happen between right now and to the end of the world as we know it. Wherever you are on the spectrum of knowing Christ or not knowing Christ, you want to hear this sermon because you'll never hear another one just like it. Congregation, will you welcome, please, the national and the international radio television ministry as our singers come. Dude. 
so aimless, I feel it's sin. I wouldn't let my dear Savior in. Then Jesus came like a stranger in the night. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. Oh, I saw the light. I saw the light. No more darkness, no more in the night. Now I'm so happy, no sorrow inside. Just like a blind man I wandered along Worries and fears I claimed for my own Then like a blind man I got me back to sight
absolutely wonderful. Y'all hold on now. Oh, what a wonderful, wonderful day. Day I will never forget. After I wandered in darkness away, Jesus, my Savior, I met. Oh, what a tender, compassionate friend. He met the need of my heart. Shadows dispelling with joy, I'm telling. He made all the darkness depart. Heaven came down and glory. The Savior made me whole. My sins were washed away, and my life was turned to day. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. Now. The passing of time I have a future In heaven for sure In those sweet mansions sublime And it's because of that wonderful day When at the cross I believe Riches eternally Bless and supernal From his precious hand I receive Yeah. 
Father, we thank you for your presence is in this place. We thank you, Heavenly Father, because you have lifted the burden. You have destroyed the yoke. You have washed us and cleansed us white as snow. Thank you for the glory that has filled our lives, our hearts, our souls, and our minds. May we use all that you have given us to bring praise and honor to your matchless name. In Jesus' name. We pray and say, amen. Give the Lord a hand clap in this house today. God bless you. You may be seated. Good morning, church. I'm Marae, and as you can see, I'm standing in the prayer garden, an amazing space dedicated to encouraging fellowship and making connections. The prayer garden is just one of several new and planned areas where you can reflect, relax, and catch up with friends before or after service. This is our opportunity to build memories together. Now here's a look at what we have coming up. Join us tonight for an incredible evening of music and celebration as Pastor Matt Hagee launches his much anticipated album, Faith, Family, and Friends. Accompanied by acclaimed artists Marty Raybon and Ben Isaacs, this live concert promises to be an unforgettable evening. Next Sunday night, it's time for our annual Soul Food Fest. Enjoy a delicious soul food meal before the service and refreshing entertainment. The event is free, but you must purchase a meal ticket online or in the lobby to enjoy the pre-service meal. This Wednesday, the Embrace Women's Ministry is going to top golf. Enjoy two hours of gameplay, a fun brunch, and a time to connect. We invite you to participate. And for the men, we have two events you want to be a part of. The first golf tournament of 2024 is coming up on Thursday, March 7th at the Canyon Springs Golf Club. Get ready for a fun-filled day of friendly competition and camaraderie. And beginning April 1st, our men's three-on-three -three basketball league is back. Gather your team or register individually, and we will pair you with a team. Register for all of these events on our website. If you'd like to become a member of Cornerstone Church, sign up for our Discover the Difference classes starting on March 3rd. 
You will learn about our pastors, mission, and beliefs. And most importantly, find out how Christ can truly transform your life. Register online today. We are so glad that you joined us today and started in your week here in the house of the Lord. Don't forget, after service, we host a meet and greet with our pastors and ministry leaders in the West Concourse. Whether you're new or a longtime member of Cornerstone Church, come and meet our pastors, ministry leaders, and staff. We pray that you have a blessed week. Good morning and God bless you. It's great to see each and every one of you here in the house of the Lord today. And those of you who are joining us, dad, viewership has gone up. They're commenting about your boots and your jeans. They love it. There's a 106 nations are tuning in to watch you preach without a tie. It's amazing. <laughs> All 50 states are joining us, plus Washington, D.C. For those of you who are joining us online, this is Cowboy Sunday. What would you think of the new worship leader that we hired? Yeah. Yeah, man, that's Marty Raybon. I mean, he, he, he sang with a few folks, Shenandoah and other things. He's won a couple of Grammys. But he'll also be here tonight at 630 for one of the greatest concerts that you'll ever see on February the 18th. And uh, that's today, by the way. Uh, 6.30 tonight, we're going to have the release of Faith, Family, and Friends. It's a brand new album that we're releasing. Uh, myself, my family, and a couple of our friends are going to be here, Marty Raybon and a few other folks, uh, to join us this evening at 6.30. And so if you want access to heaven, uh, we encourage you to be here tonight at 6.30. And be a part of this evening's festivities. Also want to let you know that immediately following our service, the grounds of our campus are open with a number of festivities and lots of fun. Uh, they've got petting zoos and pony rides and western shows. We're going to be celebrating cowboys all day here today. And so I encourage you to come and be a part of it. I got this letter written to me this week and I thought that it would be interesting to uh, recognize a very special guest that is joining us today. Uh, Junior Richards, are you here? Junior Richards, five, four, three, two, one. All right. If Junior Richards is not here, it's because his fourth great, great grandson is being born today. Junior was going to celebrate his 85th birthday and have four generations of his family here. We often talk about multiple generations of church members. Well, he was going to be the great-great-grandfather with the great-grandfather and the grandfather and the father of four generations here on his 85th birthday. God bless you, Junior, and thank you for choosing to celebrate with us today. So, Dad, it's Cowboy Sunday, and I've always held to the doctrinal and theological belief that Jesus was a cowboy. He's coming back riding on a white horse, and, you know, that's a scriptural <laughs> fact. No one can disprove it. It's written in the book. No, it's true. That's there. It's in Revelation. It, as a matter of fact, he's coming back Armageddon. He's riding a white horse. That's I mean, exactly you know, right. you're preaching Abraham to Armageddon. If Jesus wasn't a cowboy, he'd have chose a rocket or a lightning bolt, but he picked a horse. So. And, every, and everyone who follows him. We'll be riding a horse. Well, everybody from Texas will be riding a horse. Folks from New York will be catching a cab or something. But anyway, I think that, you know, there's a lot of people that, that know you as a pastor. They know you as an author. They know you in, in a number of contexts. But not many people know that you used to be a bull rider. Well, momentarily. Uh, when you, when you live in the country, the rodeo is a big deal. And uh, livestock are a big deal. Boredom is a big deal, too. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the next door neighbor uh, raised Raymer Bulls, and he had a son my age. And we'd just been to the Houston Fast Talk Show and Rodeo and watched those cowboys ride those wild bulls. So the next day I said, you know, I think I could ride that big bull out there. And uh, we, we, we rode the small ones that they had, that they call them calves, they'd be about eight, 900 pounds. But there was this big guy out there. And uh, he said, well, how will we get him in the barn? I said, you put feed in the stall, he'll go in, eat it. When he comes out, I'll get on that ladder and get on the 
roof of the barn, get on the edge of the barn. When he comes out, I'll jump on his back. <laughs> I did just exactly that. When that bull cleared the barn and my legs hit that bull just perfect, I know exactly how John Glenn felt when he was launched into space. <laughs> That bull popped his back, and I went flying through the air, hit the ground, did a somersault, and, and slid under the barbed wire fence as he went by and tried to hook me. Uh, my bull riding career ended right there. <laughs> there are some things you just shouldn't try to do a second time, and the adventure was uh, just above and beyond what I thought he was going to be. So... To this day, my favorite event at the rodeo is bull riding. And you can stay on that bull for eight seconds, brother. You deserve anything you can get. God bless you all. Again, tonight at 6.30, we're having a special concert. We encourage you to come and be a part of it. You will not be bull riding in this evening's concert. You'll just be attending and clapping, by the way. The way that we accomplish the mission of this ministry is we receive tithes and offerings and that helps us to take all of the gospel to all of the world and to every generation. I'll ask our ushers to come and take their positions as we receive our offering this morning. And to those of you who are joining and watching, you too can participate. You go online to sacornerstone.org forward slash give. Text the word give, G-I-V-E, to 210-880-2300. Call us at 855-694-9653 or write to us at P.O. Box 34930, San Antonio, Texas, 78265. Pastor, would you pray over today's offering? Could we lift our hands to the throne of grace? Our most gracious heavenly Father, look from the balconies of heaven today and behold those who are in this auditorium with hands uplifted. And those who are watching across the nations of the world, joining us in this prayer. We thank you, Lord Jesus Christ, for your sacrifice at the cross that gave us the right to be sons and daughters of the Most High God. And today we come to the house of the Lord to give of our resources that your glorious name and that your glorious grace can be known to the nations of the world. This is the day that the Lord hath made, and we rejoice in it by giving abundantly to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. May his name be glorified in all that we say and do. Amen and amen. While the ushers receive the offering, I want to make special note of some other special guests who've joined us today. Obviously, Marty Raybon is here this morning leading worship. He'll be here this evening. Ben Isaacs will be another vocalist, but we've brought in some special musicians to help us with Cowboy Sunday, and uh, I want to recognize them before they come and play the offertory. We have over on our drums, Josh Hunt. He's one of the best players in Nashville, and we're honored to have him here at Cornerstone today. You obviously know our minister of music, Sean Bird. Sitting next to Sean is Brent Rader playing the keyboard. Next to Brent is Mike Rogers playing the acoustic guitar. Zach Smith playing the electric guitar. Go in my office, look in my Kevin door. Moore is playing the fiddle today. You might think that's a violin, but trust me. When you play it the way Kevin plays it, it's not a violin, it's a fiddle, you hear? Mike Johnson is playing the steel guitar and we're honored to have Mike here with us at Cornerstone again. For those of you who wanna know what the string section in heaven is going to sound like, put on your seat belts, cause here it comes. Make welcome this marvelous band here at Cornerstone today.
but three are in the room There is faith for something new We know that you're right here in the midst Your presence is available Your promise is attainable The possibilities are limitless Oh, the possibilities are limitless can I get an amen? Amen. Can I get an amen? Amen. Oh, when you say a promise, we'll say yes and amen. Can I get an amen? Amen. Can I get an amen? Amen. Oh, when you say a promise, we'll say yes and amen. This evening's concert is entitled Faith, Family, and Friends because we've invited special guests to come and sing and join us for worship. I'm kind of homesick for the country to which I've never
men or nations think about Israel, God's opinion of Israel is the only opinion that really matters. God's not saying to America, to Iran, to Russia, to Hamas, let's make a deal. God's in heaven saying, this is the deal. America is living in a socialist anti-Semitic culture where the government is systematically destroying the difference between everything and everybody. The Bible says, he that keepeth Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps. That means God is watching all the time. In a day when Israel is fighting for its life, it's threatening to abandon the state of Israel. The fact that the day America stops blessing Israel will be the day God stops blessing the United States of America. We need to wake up as a nation and get leadership that can lead us back to being America the Great. Will you please stand for the reading of God's Word? Today we conclude our sermon series, Israel, from Abraham to the Armageddon. In this series, we have learned, one, Israel is the only nation created by the hand of God whose borders are recorded in the Bible. Two, Israel is God's firstborn son. Moses was told to tell Pharaoh in Exodus 4.22, you tell Pharaoh that Israel is my firstborn son. And if he kills my son, I will kill his son. Israel is God's firstborn. Israel was the awesome defend, has an awesome defender, God Almighty. The Bible says, he that keepeth Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps. The Bible also says, I will curse those who curse you. That's something the people in Washington should be aware of because God Almighty is watching how the nation of America treats the nation of Israel. For God as creator of earth has given Israel a royal land grant that will be in effect until Messiah comes, for, uh, c comes to Jerusalem. That land grant is right there. This is what Israel has right now. What is in the yellow from the Euphrates River to the sea, for those of you at Harvard who are trying to figure it out? There is the royal land grant that will belong to the Jewish people when Messiah comes to rule this earth 
And that day is coming. The land of Israel was given to the Jewish people by a blood covenant from God that's recorded in the scripture as he and Abraham passed between the severed pieces of the animals. And that blood covenant stands forever. Forever means forever. That means now and that means a million years from now. Six, the supernatural blessing that comes to the nation to the church or to the person that blesses Israel and the Jewish people. A simple statement that's profound and eternal. I will bless those who bless you. Say that with me. I will bless those who bless you. When you pray for the peace of Jerusalem, the Bible says they shall prosper that love you. I've examined that word prosper and it means prosper. The second sermon were 10 things that set Israel apart from all the nations of the earth. And today, the road to Armageddon. In 1945, when the Japanese surrendered, General Douglas MacArthur uttered these sobering words. He said, quote, we have had our last chance. If we do not devise some greater and more equitable system, Armageddon will be upon us. In 1971, Ronald Reagan, who was then the governor of California, told a fellow politician, quote, for the first time ever, everything is in place for the battle of Armageddon and the second coming of Jesus Christ, end of quote. That was said by a politician 50 years ago. If it was true then, I assure you, it's at the door now. With the October 7 war that rages in Israel today, world leaders are now calling for the new world order that can control the world and can control Israel before they defeat Hamas. President Biden is trying to stop Israel from defeating Hamas so that he can win his political race in Michigan with its large contingency of Arab population that'll vote against him if he takes Israel's side. The fact is, Israel did not start this war. Israel should be allowed to win this war. <laughs> Douglas MacArthur said it well, there is no substitute for victory. No substitute for victory. I have received a message from the office of the prime minister that said the message is to America, total victory, total victory, total victory over Hamas. <laughs> America's military is weaker than it's ever been in our history. Our enemies are flooding our nation with an invasion of millions across our open borders. Our economy, is saturated with debt. Our president is weak and mentally pathetic. Our university students are shouting in the streets, death and destruction to Israel and to the Jewish people. This present war in Israel has been the most vicious and bloody attack on the Jewish people since the Holocaust. It is exactly this environment in which the world or new world order will take control and introduce the Antichrist to the people of the earth. Before that can happen, hear this phrase, before that can happen, the church of Jesus Christ will be raptured from this earth to stand in the balconies of heaven. God will pull back the curtain of time and let us watch the coming bloodbath that's going to happen on planet Earth called the Great Tribulation. There are two groups of people here today. There are two groups of people watching this telecast. Those who are going to heaven to celebrate eternal life and those who missed the rapture and are going to go through seven years of hell on earth that will end at the horror of Armageddon. Which group are you going to be in? That's the question. 
And it's the most important question you will ever answer. Read with me Revelation 16, verse 12, followed by 15 and 16. Revelation 16, verse 12 says, Then the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up so that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. I want to make a comment about that. The kings of the east are China and those who come with her who are coming to the Holy Land. There was an article in the Wall Street Journal just six weeks ago that scientists right now are trying to figure out why the Euphrates River is evaporating. It's evaporating because God is going to dry it up and it will be the highway that China uses to come to the Battle of Armageddon. That's why. The 15th verse, the third, 15th verse, read, Behold, I am coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And they gather them together to the place called in Hebrew, Armageddon. Armageddon. It's a place you will never forget. Let's pray. Father, as we race toward the end of the dispensation of grace, awaken the church to the imminent coming of Jesus Christ. Awaken America to the coming of the Antichrist who will rule this world. Let those who love Christ press toward the mark of the high calling and let those who are without him choose him lest they endure the horror of the great tribulation. In the authority of Jesus' name, we pray and ask these things, and all of God's children said, amen. amen. You may be seated. Let's examine the origins of what I'm calling the New World Order. You hear it called in the paper, globalization. From the day Satan was kicked out of heaven for his rebellion against God Almighty, he has attempted to establish a new world order that would totally rebel against the spiritual authority of God in heaven. In Genesis in chapter 3, Adam and Eve rebelled against the authority of Christ. And Satan seduced them to eat the forbidden fruit lest they become like God. Angels with flaming swords drove Adam and Eve out of the earth, out of the Garden of Eden, into a world of sin and sickness and suffering. And we have suffered from that moment until this very moment because of their choice. In Genesis 7, Noah's generation failed God so miserably that God drowned every person on the face of the earth and started all over again. There were eight survivors on that ark. In the Bible, eight is the number of new beginnings. Then the origin of the new world order can be traced to the book of Genesis chapter 11, where Nimrod built the Tower of Babel. What was the purpose of this tower? It was to remove the God of heaven off the face of the earth with the mother-child cult. Why cover this? Because this goes from Abraham to Armageddon. This is something that is perpetual that you need to know about. God Almighty commanded Abraham to leave his father's house because his father was an idol worshiper, confirmed in Joshua 24 2. Point God does not bless, he does not prosper, and he does not protect an idol worshiper. The Bible says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Say that with me. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. 1 Corinthians 10, 14. My dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. Flee from idolatry. So I ask this question to you and those of you who are watching by television. Are you living in idolatry? Anything in your life that you love more than Jesus Christ is an idol. Anything. Nimrod's name in Hebrew means revolt. He was known as a murderer of innocent people and a rebel against God. He was Satan's disciple. 
Babel means confusion. The word of Bible says God is not the author of confusion. Babel was later changed to the city of Babylon. Put that together. Babylon. Historian Josephus said of Nimrod, listen, quote, he gradually changed the government into tyranny and he turned men from the fear of God to bring them under the constant dependence of the government's power, total control. What has happened in our nation just recently? Our government used COVID-19 as politicized control of the American people. It controlled the church. You have to be six feet apart. You have to wear a mask. You can't go to school. You can't do this. You can't do that. And we obeyed that because we were totally terrified. Consider Nimrod's counterfeit religion. This is in Genesis 11. This is very important. Nimrod married a woman named Samaribus. He declared himself to be the king of Babylon and his mystical bride as its first queen, as the high priestess of idolatry. Get that in your mind. The high priestess of idolatry. Here at Babel in Genesis 11 is introduced the first organized idolatrous religious system in the history of the world that survives until today. Nimrod's wife, Samarimus, knew enough about the revelation of God to know that God had promised the seed of the woman would bring the blessing to the world because of Genesis 3.15. She had a son. She called that son Tammuz. Tammuz is in the Bible. Tammuz was worshipped by Israel at one point. Samarimus called her son divine. He was to be said the fulfillment of Genesis 3.15, which is the seed of the woman. She made herself and her son objects of worship. The symbol of this false religion was the figure of a mother holding a child in her arm, and it's known throughout history as the mother-child cult. In Revelation 2, the Bible says, Pergamos is the place of Satan's throne. Fact. Satan lives at Pergamos. That's what the Bible is saying. The mother-child cult was there. From Pergamos, it went to Rome. Samarimus set herself up as the only approach to God. She adopted the title as the queen of heaven. She taught that salvation came through her by means of the sprinkling of water and ceremonial cleansing. There was purgatorial cleansing after death. She created temple virgins that we now call nuns to pray for her son who was killed, allegedly killed, by a wild beast and he came back to life. The temple virgins were to pass for to fast for 40 days. We now call that Lent. At the end of 40 days celebrated the feast of Ishtar. Ishtar has now become Easter. The Babylonian cult gave colored eggs to each other, celebrating the alleged res resurrection of her son. And we're still doing it. Let me just sidebar here. At, at Cornerstone Church, we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We celebrate the victorious Lord over death, hell, and the grave. Because he lives, we shall live also. Give him praise in the house. He and he alone is the resurrection and the life. He and he alone is Lord of all. His name is lifted above all other names. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Listen, the mother-child cult spread to Israel. When Ahab, the king of Israel, married, he married Jezebel. She was a foreigner. She was raised under the mother-child cult. Jezebel immediately started putting the prophets of Israel into prison. Soon afterwards, God started worship, the Israel started worshiping Baal, the mother-child cult, and God sent severe judgment to Israel. Listen, because we're going from Abraham to Armageddon. When God called Abraham out of Ur, he called him out of a home. 
that was occultic. Abraham's father kept his idols till the day he died. That's in Joshua 24, 2, for those of you who are passing out right now. God commanded Abraham in Genesis 12 to leave his family and to stay away from his family. The message, there must be a separation between light and darkness. There must be a separation from the church and the world. We are not like the world. There are churches trying to be so much like the world they can't introduce them to Christ. What are you willing to, what you are willing to walk away from will determine what God can bring you to. Second Chronicles, 2 Corinthians 6, 14. What fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? I'm going to say that again. What fellowship, what contact has righteousness with lawlessness? What communion has light with darkness? And then comes the word, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. Say that with me. Come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. There is one mediator between God and man. It's not the queen of heaven. It's not a man. It is the Lord Jesus Christ, the king of kings and the Lord of lords. He is our mediator. Philippians 2.9 says, Therefore God has highly exalted him, Jesus, and has given him a name above every name, and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The next appearance of the new world order, Satan says to Jesus, If you will fall down and worship me, I will give you the kingdoms of this world. And he had the kingdoms of this world. They were his. Satan was cast out of heaven. He became the prince of darkness. Prince is someone who has authority in a kingdom. Where there is spiritual darkness, Satan is in authority. I want you to get that thought in your mind. Where there is spiritual darkness, Satan is in authority. When you read occult books or watch occult movies on television, you are inviting the prince of darkness into your life. Sometimes the best thing on television is the knob that turns it off. Sadly, I tell you that the occult is being taught in public schools and universities. Where was this next generation going? We will bow to no one but Jesus Christ, King of kings and Lord of lords. He is the light of the world. Give him praise in the house. Jesus said to the church, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. The message is stop whining about the darkness and turn on the light. Turn on the light. Turn on the light. Shine for the glory of God. <laughs> Satan has authority on earth until you open your mouth and let the light of the gospel come out of your mouth. It is the spoken word of God that terrifies Satan. Satan and his demonic hordes are terrified when you quote the scripture about the blood of Jesus Christ. When you speak it, when you pray it, when you live it, you have authority over the prince of darkness. Don't let him rule your marriage. Don't let him rule your business. Don't let him rule your children. You drive him out of your life by what you confess through the authority of God's word. After World War I, the war to end all wars, Woodrow Wilson introduced the League of Nations. It failed. Then came Adolf Hitler to the German people to produce a new world order that he said would last a thousand years. It did not. He dragged Europe into the bowels of a living hell and turned Europe crimson, crimson red with human blood. Listen, Nazism is a socialist religion, and Hitler was Germany's Messiah, 
Don't ever forget that. Right now, there are forces in this nation trying to get the church shut down so that the socialist message can take over the minds of our children. It must never happen. It must never happen. It must never happen. Today, the United Nations in New York wants a new world order. What does that mean? Listen to Brock Chisholm, the director of the United World Health Organization. He says, to achieve world government, it is necessary to remove from the minds of men their individualism. That means you can't do it without government help. Two, loyalty to their families. The absentee father in America and our schools being saturated with teachers who are agnostic and atheist, the loyalty to the family is being shredded. School teachers are actually telling children in public schools, do not tell your parents what we are teaching you now. Loyalty to the, the national patriotism. Men have died by the tens of thousands to keep that flag flying. It is saturated with the blood of men and women who have served the United States of America. If you will not salute that flag, leave this country. We do not need you. We do not want you. The fourth thing is religion, faith in God. Churches in America right now are closing at a record level. Our objective is to cast God out, to control the public, to take away your freedoms one at a time. I agree with the slogan, get America out of the UN and get the UN out of America. Now we go from here to eternity. At the screen, what's going to happen next? Here we are at 2024. The next thing to happen is the rapture of the church. Why? Because Israel has been reborn in 1948. Jerusalem has been reunited in 1967. The knowledge explosion that Daniel talked about in Daniel the 12th chapter has happened. Scoffers, that's one of the key signs of the coming of the Lord. Saying, where is the sign of his coming? You've been talking about that since our fathers and it hasn't happened. Those scoffers are alive and well on the streets of America and some of them are in the pulpits of America. Where is the sign of his coming? This book is saturated with the sign of his coming. You're not ready for his coming, so you doubt it. What is the judgment seat of Christ? We will go from here as to the judgment seat of Christ. I don't have that written here because there's enough space. The judgment seat of Christ is only for Christians. 2 Corinthians 5.10 says, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may receive the things done in his body, I'm quoting the scripture, according to what he has done, whether good or bad. When we are in heaven at the judgment seat of Christ, you're going to receive a crown. There are five different kinds of crowns. There's the victor's crown. There's the martyr's crown. There's the elder's crown. There's the soul winner's crown. There's the crown of righteousness. You'll be able to look at a person's crown and tell what they did when they were on this earth. You will receive a robe that reflects the righteous acts that you committed on this earth. That's very clear in the scripture. The question is, what have you done for Jesus and what will your robe look like when you get to heaven? The judgment of Christians happens at the judgment seat of Christ. There's a seven year celebration now, those of you who like fiestas, brother, this is going to be off the charts. For seven years, one glorious celebration, the marriage supper of the Lamb, 
the bride of Christ, that's us, meeting the Savior and being with him for seven years of absolute peace. The judgment of sinners happens at the great white throne judgment. The judgment of Christians happens here. The judgment of those who do not know Jesus are right here. This is the thousand and seven years after this. Why? This is where the Bible says there is weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. Why? Because they know they are coming from hell to be sentenced here. To be sentenced here. And they're going to go and Back to the lake of fire. Get the sequence. Christians are judged here. The ungodly are judged here. The ungodly now go to hell, which is somewhere down here. Then they come to be judged here, only to be sentenced. That's why there's weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. They know they are going back to live forever and forever in the flames of hell. I want to ask you something. Are you going to be here? Or are you going to be here? Because everyone in this room is going to be in one of those two places. Back to earth. In the great tribulation begins. The Antichrist rides out onto the stage of world history. This is him Riding a white horse. Why is he riding a white horse? Because he's an imitator of God. Jesus is riding a white horse when he comes back the second time. The Antichrist is going to make a treaty with Israel. A seven-year treaty. He promises Israel the new world order that will form immediately after the church is gone. When the church is gone, there will be a global economic collapse because we're the last one paying taxes. There will be instantly a global network. The Antichrist will choose 10 men on the face of the earth to rule with him a government that will rule the world. Those 10 men will be over specific regions on the planet. The Antichrist will make a seven-year treaty with Israel, bringing peace between Israel and the Arab nations. Do you think that's going to be something that's going to excite them? I guarantee you, many Jewish people will think the Antichrist is the Messiah. Daniel 9, 27 says, He, the, the Antichrist, shall confirm the covenant with many. That's Israel for one week. That's seven years. The new world order will support Israel's right to the land. And many Jewish people are going to think the Antichrist is the, is the Messiah. The Antichrist will burst into the world as the, sta- as the Prince of Peace. The world will wonder after him. He will produce a one world government, a one world currency, and a one world religion. He will cause craft to prosper, and through peace he will destroy many. How's that happen? Through peace he will destroy many, meaning he will write peace treaties he never intends to keep. He will trap you into an agreement and then shut it off when he wants to control you. He will be Hitler on steroids. He is the chief son of Satan. The Bible calls him that. In the first part of the tribulation, the third temple in Jerusalem is rebuilt as a part of that peace treaty. When I went to Jerusalem to pray for the opening of the U.S. Embassy, a rabbi raced up to me, grabbed my hand and shook it. He was shouting. He said, now we can build the third temple. The Jewish people are looking forward to this. When the Antichrist pledges to make that possible, they're going to follow him. The Antichrist will fulfill the prophecy of Jesus in Matthew 24, 15 as the abomination of desolation. This is the prophecy of Jesus. What is the abomination of desolation? This is when the Antichrist sets up his image at the, at the third temple and demands for the world to worship him. Satan wants worship. 
The Antichrist will demand worship. Those who do not will have their heads cut off. Here's the time that 144,000 Jewish believers begin their great evangelistic ministry to the Jewish people that Messiah is coming. How are they going to be converted? Exactly like the Apostle Paul on the road to Damascus when he was knocked off his horse by God and the scales fell from his eyes. And he said, who are you, Lord? And what would you have me do? 12,000 out of each 12 tribes, 144,000 telling Messiah is coming. The Gog Magog army invades Israel three and a half years after the treaty with the Antichrist. This is it right here. The Gog Magog battle, the rapture three and a half years later, the Antichrist is going to break the covenant right after this war. The Gog Magog Russia Iran attack Israel. This is something that is coming into focus right now. This massive army will consist of Russia, Iran, Libya, Turkey, and several anti-Semitic nations in the Middle East. Their common denominator is anti-Semitism, just like Hamas. They hate, their hatred for Israel and the Jewish people is off the charts. Listen closely. These God-hating anti-Semitic nations bound by the hatred of the Jewish people are going to be slaughtered by the hand of God. I'm going to tell you this. Following what we are just experiencing, God is going to kill, destroy, and crush every nation that comes up against Israel. Ezekiel 38 Go ahead. (laughs) Write this verse down. Ezekiel 38, 18. God says to the enemies of Israel, my fury shall come up in my face. For in my love and jealousy for the Jewish people in the fire of my wrath have I spoken. Ezekiel 39, 2. God will slaughter five out of six of that army that's coming. How? First, he will use an earthquake, just like he did for Moses at Sinai. There will be nine different armies there, and he's going to open the ground and bury a good section of them. And then they will have friendly fire. Because of that earthquake, those armies will turn their weapons firing at whatever and will kill each other. But lastly, God saves the treat for himself. He will cast stones from heaven and execute personally these people who have come against his people. You see, God has never done that before. Oh, yes, he has. Read Joshua 10. When Joshua was battling for the survival of Israel, God God stoned those five kings. That's in your Bible. God is doing what he has done before. At the end of the day, Only one-sixth of those people are left. They will go back to the nations from which they came, Russia, Iran, etc., and say, the God of Israel, he is God. He is God. (laughs) Now follow quickly. We're at the middle of the week. Right here, The Antichrist is going to break the treaty with Israel. Why? Because he never intended to keep it to start with. Why? Because God has just wiped out Russia, Iran, Libya, Turkey, and all of those armies. There's a vacuum created. He consolidates his empire by capturing all the nations that came against Israel in the Gog Magog War. That story is told in Daniel 11, 42 and 43. The Antichrist is shot in the head and he recovers miraculously, emulating the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Satan himself is cast out of heaven and he makes war with Israel in Revelation 12. The Torah observant Jews will flee to Petra where they will be protected by the hand of God for three and a half years. 
Elijah and Enoch, the two witnesses, began their three and a half years of ministry in Israel in Malachi 4.3. Elijah and Enoch are going to have supernatural powers. Now, think of a preacher having this kind of supernatural power. Anyone that tries to hurt them, they will have the ability to call fire from heaven and they will cremate that person even before the conversation is over. They can breathe fire out of their mouth and consume anyone that even tries to hurt them. Elijah will have the power to control the weather, to stop, to cause a drought, no rain, power to turn water to blood, to smite the earth with plagues as often as he desires. When we say our God is an awesome God, you haven't seen anything until you see the great tribulation. He is an awesome God. In the last half of the tribulation, the seven trumpets of judgments are being released on the earth. There are 21 I have here. These are the seven seals, the seven trumpets, and the seven vials. These should be spread across the top here, but we did not have the ability to get that done. These are 21 judgments that are coming on the face of the earth. Divide 21 by seven. That means every four months, a worldwide calamity is coming that men will pray to God that they would be killed by the hand of God rather than endure that. John the Revelator describes the second coming, and I saw the heavens opened, and he that sat upon a white horse, here we are, right here, here we are. He that sat upon a white horse was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he that judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. He is clothed in a white vesture dipped in blood. Why? Because when Jesus comes, he's going to, he's going to come back to the Mount of Olives. You, you see those white horses behind him? Cowboy Sunday, that's the biggest group you're ever going to be with. We're going to be on a white horse. I think Jesus is probably going to have to give riding lessons to some of you when we're in heaven. We're going to ride back. And Jesus is going to sweep over the battle of Armageddon. And he is going to destroy the army of China which will be over 200 million people. That's not my number. That's in the book of Revelation. He will come against the king of the West, which will be Europe and probably America. They're fighting for global supremacy. God is going to kill everybody on that battlefield so that the blood will run to the bridle of a horse that would be about that deep. 37 miles this way and 18 miles that way, a pool of blood and carnage. That's why Jesus has on his robe blood. He has just knocked off the enemies of Israel, demonstrated he is Lord, he is King of Kings. Give him praise in the house of God. When that battle has been ended, there's a 75-day interval. This is in Daniel, the 12th chapter. And the following things happen very quickly. The Antichrist and the false prophet are thrown into hell. The Antichrist image is removed from the temple in Jerusalem. Righteous Jews are regathered by angels from Petra. They're no longer in hiding, and they come to Jerusalem to worship Messiah, Matthew 24, 31. Gentiles who took the mark of the beast are judged and cast into hell. Some of you might be there. If you've not accepted Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, I assure you, 
you will be there. Righteous Jews from the Old Testament and New Testament will be resurrected and rewarded. Just hang tight, evangelicals. We're not the only one there. Daniel 12, Isaiah 26, Revelation 20, confirm what I have just said. Righteous Jews from the Old Testament and New Testament are resurrected and rewarded in the presence of Messiah. The millennial temple is reconstructed. The beauty defies the imagination, the Bible says. 1,000 years of perfect peace begins under the reign of Jesus Christ. After 1,000 years, there will be no wars, no crime, no injustice. The lion will lay down with the lamb. The Bible says your child can play in a cockatrice nest. Cockatrice, that's a poisonous snake. Your child can play with a poisonous snake and you will not be concerned about it. There will be no fake news on the late news. There will be only good news and will come from Jerusalem and it will start like this. Today, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords has returned to planet Earth. Hallelujah for the Lamb of of God. (laughs) Then comes the great white throne judgment. It happens here. If you haven't received Jesus Christ, right there it's going to happen. After that, we are in heaven now, the body of Christ. The earth is going to be be burned with fire to purge it, to cleanse it. And the Garden of Eden is going to be recreated. 7,000 years right here with the new heavens and the new earth. We have what we have in Genesis 1 and 1, a perfect world. And we're going to have that forever and forever and forever. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Let me close with this. Where are you going to spend eternity? Either in heaven or in the fires of hell. No other option. The only way you get to heaven is confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord of your life. If you do not do that, I assure you, you're going to live forever and forever with the devil and his angels in the place called hell. So are your relatives. Morality will not save you. Giving does not save you. Only accepting Jesus Christ as the Lord of your life will save you. That and that alone. When the Antichrist comes and you do not take his mark, he's going to cut your head off. The Bible says that. I wouldn't be so cold-blooded as to say that. The Bible says that. I ask you what Apostle Paul asked. What will you do with Jesus who is called the Christ? You accept him or reject him? Nothing else. And blessed is the man who lives in poverty on this earth and has Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior than the richest man on the earth who dies and goes to hell forever and forever and forever. Think about that. Stand to your feet. How many in this audience, you know, beyond a shadow of a doubt that if Jesus came before we get out of this building, you would go straight to heaven. You know that. Let me see your hand. Put your hands down. How many of you can say, Pastor, I want to go to heaven, but I've never received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And today I want to do that. If that describes you, would you slip your hand up right where you are right now? Raise your hand. Thank you. God bless you. I want you to come forward. I want you to come forward. Come from the balcony. You know you're not ready. I want you to come. Come on. Start walking this way. Start walking this way.
Some of us are sitting there trying to make up your mind. You really sure? Are you really sure? How many of you have relatives that are not anymore ready to meet Jesus? They have never made that preparation. And your relatives are going to be forever in the place called hell. If that defines you, can I see your hand? The most. They need to hear a personal witness from you. That we are getting ready to leave this world and they should know Christ. Would you just come, come right over here? Come right here. Come here. I know because I know some of you need to be right here. I want you to come in the next 30 seconds or I'm going to close the door and you can answer for it in eternity. Jesus Christ, is he the Lord of your life? Come. You're not joining the church. You're just going to heaven. Come on. Come on. There you are. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Yes, yes, yes. Push by. He'll let you out. Come on. Yeah. Come on. Some of you over here. Some of you over here. Come on. Come on. Come right here. Look at me. You have just made the greatest decision you will ever make in your life. We're going to pray this prayer. And when we pray this prayer, Jesus is going to be the Lord of your life. All of your life. Congregation, pray this prayer with me. Lord Jesus Christ. I ask you to forgive me of all of my sins. Cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Write my name in the Lamb's book of life. From this day forward, I will serve you. I will read your word and I will obey that word. From this day forward, Jesus is the Lord of my life forever and forever. Amen. 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 Pastor, go with him. Would you just go with this young man right here? He wants to chat with you just a bit about what we do next. And now may the Lord bless you and may the Lord keep you. And may the Lord make his face to shine upon you. May the Lord be gracious unto you and give you his peace. May you prepare for the coming of the Son of God because he will soon appear in the clouds of heaven to rapture the church of Jesus Christ. The King is coming. The King is coming. The King is coming. Amen. Give the Lord a shout of praise in the house. Amen. Good as joining us today. I pray that you were encouraged as you heard Pastor Hagee share this powerful word. And if you made that decision to receive Christ as your Savior, I want you to call us and contact us. Let us know how we can pray and encourage you in this very important moment in your life. Also, stay tuned for the 11 o'clock service. Or if you know someone who needs to hear a powerful message, have them join us 
because we're going to have our second service beginning in just a few moments. Those of you who are watching, I can encourage you to continue watching as there's more content coming your way from Cornerstone. And if you're in the area, be here tonight at 630 for a fabulous concert. If you wanted to participate in giving today, you can do that by going online to sacornerstone.org forward slash give or text the word give, G-I-V-E, to 210-880-2300. Call us at 855-694-9653 or write to us at P.O. Box 34930, San Antonio, Texas, 78265. God bless you. I look forward to seeing you soon from Cornerstone Church. You're watching Hagee Ministries. Don't go away. Here's more teaching from the Word of God. Hello and welcome to this Sunday conversation. We're continuing with our teaching on getting back to the basics. Last we talked, we discussed Paul's writings to the believers in the book of Hebrews, telling them that by now they should be past the elementary principles of the faith. They should have grown. They should have developed. But because they could not, understand what he was teaching them, he had to revisit some concepts and some doctrines that they had already been told yet had not applied nor willingly understood. And that brings us to this next installment of teaching. Before we get into the doctrines and the tenets of the faith, we have to first and foremost come to the conclusion about what the Word of God is in our lives. When people ask you, do you read the Bible, are they talking about a historical document? Are they talking about a collection of stories? Or when you hear the word Bible, do you really believe that it is the Word of God, His voice in your life? The reference for this conversation is John chapter 1, verse 1. But before we get into the serious content of Bible study, let me ask you this question. Have you made up your mind whether or not this is the spoken word of God recorded by men through the interpretation of the Holy Spirit? Because until you have that in your heart, in your mind, I'm not certain that you're ready to allow this word to lead you, to guide you, and to shape you. This is God's word. When you read this word, You're hearing His voice in your life. You're reading His will and how you should live. These pages are alive. You don't just read it, it reads you. You can visit these texts over and over and over again, and every time you open the Word, it's something new. You can read, God hasn't given me a spirit of fear, but of power and love and sound mind. And sometimes that's a verse that brings you a little extra confidence. And sometimes those same words are the only verse that holds you together when everything in your life seems to be falling apart. The point I'm making is because this is the Holy Spirit inspired word of God, these pages can lift you into the highest realms of heaven or at other times they can cause you to tremble in repentance and confess your sin. These words can both be filled with sorrow and joy, give you strength and rest, or bring peace in moments of torment. This is, as you've heard me say many times, the compass of the soul. Everyone needs good directions to get through life. And the Bible very clearly says, thy word is a lamp unto thy feet and a light unto thy path. It doesn't really matter what topic you're looking for. The Bible has something to say about it. If you're interested in finding out how you can have a better marriage, the Bible is a marriage manual. It speaks about the godly roles of a husband, the godly roles of a a wife. It's filled with love stories. It's action-packed. The Bible is also a business book. I know many business leaders who want to build barriers between their business life and their spiritual life. But when you read the Bible, it's filled with content that is very applicable and powerful in the life of business leaders. You shall lend and not borrow, for example. 
Another place in Ecclesiastes, we read that it is good for you to wear the yoke in your youth. How many business leaders understand that when you're young, you have a lot of energy, you have a lot of things that you can accomplish, but as you grow, you need to start working with your wisdom and not just by bearing the load. A multitude of things that you can find for business leaders are in the word of God. This is the spiritual bread that your heavenly father has given to you to not only nourish your soul, but give you the strength that you need to carry the weight and the burden of the life that you live. These pages are his last will and testament concerning your inheritance in his kingdom to come and his desire for your life. If you believe that this is the word of God, then you'll allow it to be everything that it promises to be. A lamp, a sword, a shield, a banner, everything that God intended but it comes with you making up your mind that this is his word. Put your faith in it because the Bible says without faith, it is impossible to please God. Think about how that applies to what we're talking about concerning the word of God. Without faith in this being the word of God, it's very difficult to believe. You can't accomplish what his word says to accomplish without the faith to do so. That's why the Bible tells us in many places, the just shall live by faith. I wanna to read to you John chapter one and verse one, and then give you the context for why I believe that this is the word of God. John one and one. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was, was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him and without him, nothing was made that was made. These are the first three verses of the book of John. And when you begin to read them, immediately you're given a reference point in the beginning. That's Genesis one and one. In the beginning, we read God created the heavens and the earth. How did God create the heavens and the earth? God created the heavens and the earth with his spoken word. So what we're reading in John chapter one agrees with what we have as an account in Genesis chapter one. God said, let there be light. God said, separate the land from the water. God said that the stars should be in the night sky, that the moon should shine at this time, that the sun should shine at this time, that the sun would be the greater light and the lesser light. All of those details are in the Genesis account, but in every one of these details, you read this pattern. God said, God said, God said said Genesis one and one and John chapter one are in full agreement with one another. It's like your left hand and your right hand clapping in rhythm with each other. Now, why is that important? Because sometimes when people wanna argue whether or not the Bible is the word of God, they want to point to contradictions. However, the Bible does not contradict itself. It is in agreement. And not only is that a remarkable fact in and of itself, just considering the vastness of the content, but when you consider how far the authors were from one another, they were separated by time, they were separated by distance, they were separated by a multitude of things. And yet in spite of the centuries of separation, in spite of the geographical separation, in spite of the historical separations, they all agree with each other. They never got together and cooperated their stories. They came from the same source and that source was the Holy Spirit. As the Bible tells us that all scripture is given by inspiration of the Spirit. In the Bible, we read about the things that God created. He created the heavens and the earth. In Genesis chapter three and verse 15, we read a very important prophetic word. This is during the judgment that God is handing to Adam and to Eve and to the serpent. And in Genesis three and 15, we read these words. The seed of the woman shall crush the head of the serpent. 
it's a very simple verse to read and just pass by. But what you need to understand are these things. Biologically, women do not have seed. They have an egg and it needs to be fertilized in order for it to create life. But God uses the term seed. Zira is actually the Hebrew word. And what he is saying is the power of life and the seed that comes out of the woman shall crush the head of the serpent. The serpent we know is that serpent of old, the devil. But the seed was the son of God, Jesus Christ, born of a virgin. Isaiah prophesied that there would be a virgin that would conceive. Matthew, in his gospel, tells us how a virgin girl in the region of Galilee hears from the angel Gabriel and the angel tells her that she is going to conceive and bear a child. Mark tells us how this baby came to be the ransom for many in the gospel that he shares about Jesus Christ and his ministry. Luke, who was sent to find out whether or not the gospel was true, comes and he writes to the individual that commissioned the study, Theophilus. He says, Theophilus, I'll actually read it to you in Luke's gospel. Luke chapter one. Inasmuch as many have taken in hand to set in order a narrative of those things which are most surely believed among us. So Luke is beginning this letter by saying, Many people have done all that they can to create the story because we believe the story. He says, just as those, this is verse two, from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word delivered them to us. He's saying, so we've heard the eyewitness accounts of what Jesus did. In verse three, he said, it seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first to write to you an orderly account, most excellent Theophilus. So this Theophilus is an individual who asked Luke, go find out if what we have heard is true. And then he writes in verse four, that you may know the certainty of those things in which you were instructed. He says, I have come, I have investigated, I have talked with people who walked with Jesus, I have talked with people who were at the teachings, I have talked with people who saw the miracles. And in verse four, he says, you can be certain that the things which you heard actually happened. Then he continues in his gospel to talk about the compassionate Savior who healed the sick, who fed the hungry, who touches the untouchable, who loves the unlovable the son of God, the one who sat and ate with sinners. Luke fills his entire letter, which we hold as one of the gospels. Understanding this, Luke was not one of the 12 disciples. Luke was an individual who heard the gospel after Jesus had ascended and came to investigate whether or not it was the word of God, whether or not it was true. And he says, it is all true true. So we get to John's gospel and he begins in Genesis saying, Jesus just didn't show up in the last century. Jesus has been here from the very beginning. Why? Because he wants all who are reading to understand that this is the living, breathing word of God. This book is alive. So let me ask you, if this book is alive, what role does it play in your house? What role does it play in your daily routines and habits? How often do you reference it, obey it, and look to it for the counsel and the wisdom that it can provide? If I told you that I had a source that never failed, and every time that you picked it up, it provided exactly what you needed when you needed it. Would you just let it sit idle for months and weeks and days at a time? 
or would you begin every day taking a moment to consider what it says? When you decide that this is the word of God, not just a Bible, not just a tradition, not just something that your grandmother gave you at Christmas, not just something you carry with you to church, but this is the breath of heaven breathing into your life. That's when you're going to begin to grow. That's when you're going to begin to see the hand of God move in your life in very tangible and real ways. How do I know that? Not only because I've experienced it, but that's what the Bible says. The Bible says, my word will not return void. It shall accomplish the purpose for which I sent it. And I want you to know and believe right now that God has sent a word for you. And when you believe in his word and you put it to practice, it will accomplish the purpose for which he sent it. Join us next week as we begin to discuss the purpose of the Bible and how it applies to your everyday life. In our lives, we must be true worshipers who embrace God's presence, regardless of our surroundings. How can the power of praise change your life? Thank Him, be humbled and obedient to Him, and see His power released in your life. To help experience the power of praise, consider our latest project, the Heaven in This Place live album CD, with our very own Cornerstone Sanctuary Choir. For a generous gift of $175 or more, receive this album along with an exclusive Psalm 100 artwork and the Heaven in This Place live concert DVD. I pray these resources will bless your home. We're created in the image of our Heavenly Father and every blessing we receive is a gift of His divine will. To receive your gift today, Call the number on your screen or visit jhm.org slash praise. Hi, I'm Kendall Hagee. Thank you for connecting with us today. God bless you, and we pray that you'll join us again next week.